Welcome back to HANA Basics for Developers. So in the previous video, we looked at creating a simple SAP UI5 application that declares its OData v2 service in its manifest and then uh, binds that to a table control. Now, it was a little bit of a simplistic example, as I said, because we hard-coded the columns. So why don't we go back into that application and see how we can make it a little bit more robust and realistic by using the metadata to dynamically declare the columns that are available in the OData service and, and put those in the UI without having to uh, predefine anything in our application. So let's return to the web IDE. And we're just going to go back into the same application. We're not going to make a whole lot of changes here. Let's take the section where we defined um, the binding of our table to our model. And uh, we'll just comment that out. And uh, what we want to do is we've got a, got a whole new snippet here. And let's bring that in and then we'll have a look at it. Four, twenty-three. This is going to be similar to what we did a couple of videos ago when we did the entire OData service dynamically. But now what we want to do is we want to uh, create a function uh, that will um, do the same thing here. Take the table and set the BP model into the table. Uh, but then also still set our, our entity set. So that, that hasn't really changed. We just put it in a try-catch block inside of a function. Uh, the main reason for doing that is because after we bind it, we also want to get the service metadata from it. Okay, so that will make, uh, we're still, the, the SAP UI5 model object was always calling the dollar sign metadata, but now what we want to do is we want to get access to that. We want to get the, the raw metadata back uh, so that we can use that data, in which case we're going to we're gonna do a loop over uh, that data. And, um, you know, so we're going to say we only have one schema, so we're going to go to the first schema inside the data. And actually, we only have one entity. Uh, this could perhaps be a bit more complex if we had multiple entities and we'd have to go through them and look for our specific entity name. We couldn't just trust that the first entity was going to be it. In my particular target service, I only have one entity, so I can safely just say, give me the first entity, and then I'm going to go through this one property at a time. And for each property, I'm going to uh, build the string of header fields. And then what you can see here is instead of hard coding the set initially visible fields, we're going to take all the fields that were found in the metadata and we're going to uh, uh, set those initially visible. Okay. Um, now what we can do here is we can say uh, our model attach metal metadata loaded. You know, we don't want to just call this, if I, I, you know, you should just have this in line here in the event handler and, and I tried to access the metadata right away, but, but this is happening asynchronous, similar to uh, how we had to deal with the asynchronous nature of Node.js. Increasingly, even client-side JavaScript does a lot of things asynchronous for efficiency to not block the web browser. Um, so the metadata might not be loaded right away. We're loading the view. Uh, maybe the model is, is initialized and the metadata is loaded. Maybe it isn't yet. So we'll attach an event handler here to say whenever the metadata is fully loaded, then try to do this logic. So, so we'll know at this point when we call the get service metadata that, that it is available because it is finished being loaded. Uh, so we don't have any uh, timing problems or anything like that. We're not uh, we're not relying on that um, uh, always always being the case here. Um, so uh, little change to our application, not uh, not really a big deal. But what you're going to see as soon as I run this to pick up the changes is that now we see many more columns here. Instead of our hard-coded list of three columns, uh, we see several columns being output. So this is, a, uh, as I said, a more realistic and more robust application. Now, while we're in here, why don't we look at some of the other test options that we have in the, um, uh, from the web IDE, some of the others that we haven't seen yet. If I go back into my run configurations, 
Uh, just like we use this to change which target application, there's some other settings. We can, of course, add URL parameters and things like that. We don't have any in this particular application. But let's, uh, let's run with the support assistant. This is a pretty cool feature. It's like a, almost like a static checker for your client-side SAP UI5. So we'll, we'll run with this option. So we'll save and rerun it and start the application again. Um, and what you're going to see here is we get this little assistant tool down here at the bottom of the screen. You see the SAP UI5 support assistant. Let's make that a little larger. And basically there's a bunch of rule sets uh, where it can run uh, rules against our application and do checks. Uh, so we have specific rules for the UI elements that we're using, and we've got overall generic rules. Let's just run them all, and we'll do an analyze. And this will take a couple of seconds to analyze our complete application. And when it's done, you get a little error report here, and uh, priority high, medium, low. Um, so let's look at these. What, what's, uh, what do we have in our application? So from the error logs, it's basically saying, okay, so it's a low. There were some things that were jump, dumped into the error log from the page itself. Actually, neither of these are anything to be worried about. One is that we don't have a component preload.js. As I said, SAP UI5 kind of probes the server just by requesting things to see if they're available. And in the XSA environment with the Web IDE for SAP HANA, we do not um, we do not do a grunt build on the SAP UI5, so we're not creating a component preload JS. So that's perfectly normal and and to be expected in our environment. And also the flexibility service not being available, um, that's also normal. Uh, the flexibility service is part of Fiori applications, the ability to um, uh, to configure them. Uh, flexible applications, um, we has simply haven't built this application to run as a Fury application or run in the Fury Launchpad, uh, so we don't have that. So, so ne neither of those are any problem. They can be ignored. Uh, what we see here, asynchronous views. Now, this is a medium. It's saying that our view is actually not being loaded asynchronously. We're loading it Synchronously. That's something I'm going to look into later, see if I can uh, make a little change to some of these examples. Um, maybe um, take advantage of a, uh, a newer best practice from, from when these were originally written. One of the things I like about this, not only does it point out the spot in the code where you have this problem, give you a description, but it's got a place to take you to the resolution. So it takes you right to the documentation. Uh, in the online help for for how you can improve this. So so for instance, you know this is something I didn't even uh, I, I hadn't looked into. I'm going to read this documentation later and and uh, hopefully get rid of this item and improve the uh, loading of my application. The last one has to do with stable IDs. Um, so I have some UI elements that I'm not assigning an ID to, and, and it's right, I'm not. I'm not. If we look at my uh, app view XML, um, I, I'm not giving everything an ID. I'm not giving my page an ID. I am giving my smart table an ID, uh, but really, for for if you're going to allow the flexibility service, everything needs to have a declared ID. This is just sort of lazy on my part. When you don't declare an ID, then the framework will generate one for you. Um, but then those are not um, not not fixed. Uh, they can't be relied upon to be consistent from one run to another. And therefore, the flexibility service needs the needs those IDs to be consistent so we can track uh, attached configuration and personalization options. So really, to be better here, I, I should really give IDs to, to all these UI elements. Uh, that's probably something I'll go in and clean up later. Although, that's specific to the flexibility service. I know in my use case, I'm not... Um, uh, I'm not uh, using the flexibility service, but still, I'll, I'll probably go in and clean that up. Uh, but it's nice to have a few things to look at here. This is a great little tool uh, to help you improve the quality of your code. I mean, it's not catching syntax errors. We obviously don't have any syntax errors, but, but uh, Im improve the general uh, uh, quality of my code. Now, uh, the other thing I want to show you while we're in here is the other option. We've been running all these applications via the index HTML, which means it goes through the bootstrap, and, and then we have to create our own little shell object. Um, maybe let me just run that again real quick. 
Uh, so the SAP logo, the log off button, the little thing here with personalization, um, would show me my username if I had a hook into a service to do that. Um, e even this header with the OData basic exercise, that's all being provided by the, the shell initialization that I have in the startup.js that I hook into all of my index HTML. But the other option that we have here is I could create a different run configuration and run this in the Fiori Launchpad, a little sandboxed version of the Fiori Launchpad. And you notice what we see here is Fiori Launchpad, uh, when, when we do tiles, um, we don't load them via index HTML. We don't uh, have a bootstrap. The bootstrap is provided by the Launchpad itself, and we directly hook different components into our page. And this allows us to dynamically have... Um, you know, the navigation between components, the embedding of the components. So what we're going to do here is we're going to go to our uh, OData Basic and load its component, and we'll do it within the launch pad. And what you're going to see here, the structure, the approach that we're using, the way we segregate out our logic to load our shell in our index HTML, keep our component JS clean, we're actually creating applications that work both ways. They, they work standalone or they work fine within the Fiori launch pad. And you see the visual changes here. Um, our application is still essentially the same. We have the same smart control, uh, or smart table uh, going on here. Uh, but now it, uh, our header is being supplied by the Fiori Launchpad. Um, you know, our user details. This is not the real Fiori Launchpad. This is a sandbox version, but it's simulating what it would look like exactly in the Fiori Launchpad. We can even go back here and... Uh, go back to the Launchpad home and see what it looks like as a as a tile. We haven't configured any tile settings, so no description, no live data, no icon, um, but we see a little bit of what that looks like, and we would have the ability, you know, we can navigate back into our application. So we can see what this looks like and how it will function if we were to deploy this inside of a Fury Launchpad. So we really have a lot of great testing options here. Um, that, that we've explored, and, and really uh, these can be applied to any of our applications. I just choo chose this little bit shorter video. We didn't have quite as much content uh, to show you in this video. I thought it was a good time to also explore some of the other test run options that we have uh, from the SAP Web IDE for SAP UI 5 applications.